most churches talk about the past and look ahead to the return of Jesus. But what if a church started at the end and looked back? And what if this church was available not just to one community, but the whole world? Are you discouraged because churches neglect to teach and prepare for the end times, the restoration of Israel, the reality of Islam, and persecution? Are you currently seeking a church that embraces those concerns? Would you like to be a part of something that is spiritually groundbreaking and world-changing? We are the End Time Church, a church with the end in mind. Join us now at endtime.church. Hello, this is Pastor Jake McCandless with endtime.church, and this is a special video that we're putting together for our Rapture Week. You know, Discovery Channel has their Shark Week, uh, but we thought, how could we talk about a topic that's more blood in the water, that's more controversial, that may uh, even produce more conflict? So we said, let's do Rapture Weeks, and so we're taking five weeks uh, to really give the Rapture 360 view and uh, approach it from every direction. Uh, but I wanted the chance to uh, bring Miss Annette Bell on. Uh, Annette is one of the reasons that I, I believe, had my eyes open. I, I believe she reached out to me and was a divine appointment in helping me uh, just come to dealing with the scriptures on what it says about the timing of the rapture. And uh, so out of the blue, Annette, I, I didn't know Annette. Uh, she t- she uh, messaged me on Twitter and begins to walk through some verses with me. So I wanted to bring her on because she has such a passion uh, to help people get this right. So Annette, I'm glad you could have joined me. And I've got a few Hi. questions I want to I want to ask you. And uh, I just want to give our folks at End Time Church a chance to meet you, as well as the opportunity just to hear your heart. Just out of the blue, when Spiritual Prepper came out, uh, you messaged me and just said, hey, look at this, these two passages. It took me through a thread of passages that just opened my eyes. And I, I greatly appreciate you doing that. But I, And I see often, I'm not the only one to re- receive such tweets from you. Our, um, <laughs> uh, so obviously you're passionate about people understanding the rapture uh, will be later. Uh, why are you so passionate about that? Yes, um, it's because, well, when God opened my eyes, I was about 16 or 17 years old, and I'm really confident that he's going to gather us at his second coming. And it it was so important to me seeing all the apostasy that is predicted in scripture that we know what to expect and what God expects of us. And why I reached out to you, um, well, I reached out to a lot of people, as you said, but one of the things that made me want to is you were talking about you wrote this book called Spiritual Prepper. And I was like, well, does you know about like the most important thing to spiritually prepare for, which is the tribulation to go through it and spiritually endure? Yeah, I mean, and I really see that people are at a dangerous point. I mean, that, oh, that was me. It was a pastoral heart. of I'm just seeing people turn away and I'm concerned you know, what can we do to help them prepare? And I'm thinking now and in the future. And uh, and then, you know, so I'm on that journey already. And then you reach yeah. out and just really push me because I'm all the time I'm trying to, you know, I'm saying I'm trying to get scripture right. And you really push me to say, hey, this is uh, this is what the scripture says. And uh, but you, but you're right. I mean, and, and so I appreciate you sharing that passion because they're. It, it's a dangerous scenario, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I. I think it's really the foundation of what we believe is really the foundation for apostasy when it's wrong, because so many different reasons why people apostatize. But at the underlying foundation, if we think we're not going to be here, we're not going to expect to go through all this stuff. We're not going to be prepared. And and so that brings Mm -hmm. me to the next question. I really wanted to to uh, pick your brain about this. I mean, what's the biggest reason that you're opposed to the pre-tribulation view? Um, I mean, you alluded to it, but I mean, what's your, your biggest problem with that? Well, the scriptures tell a different story and the main, really the main reason is I don't want people to fall away because they've been trusting in a deception that feels good. And 
I mean, I know that people can fall away for different reasons and our theology isn't everything. We can still fall away even if we know exactly what to expect because we don't obey. So, but really it's, it's caring about people, not wanting, not wanting them to fall away is the main, main reason. And we're not hearing this in churches most of the time. Um, I didn't grow up hearing it in my church and I'm still not hearing it in my church. So, yeah. And, and so, so you reach out to a lot of folks on Twitter. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, with me, I mean, you simply walk through some passages. I, I, I'm curious, I mean, what, what's the go-to passages and, and what's the most convincing argument uh, that, that you feel like you can give to help people change their mind? Well, people are different. Um, but I can tell you two that two things that have one thing that helped me and one thing that helps a lot of people that I've heard. Um, for me, uh, first Thessalonians four, 15 through 17, it's like the classic rapture passage. And I noticed when I was reading it, um, when I was searching to see is pre-tribulation rapture taught anywhere. When I looked at that really closely, I noticed that there's two groups of people, two groups of Christians that Jesus is talking about, or Paul is talking about and, um, by the Holy spirit. There are the people who are dead in Christ, who are, who, I mean, dead in Christ, like they have died, but they were in Christ when they died. And those who are alive and remain in him, or they are alive and they have abided in Christ up to that point of him coming back. So there's a difference between the two. And in verse 15, it it says that the alive and remain will not, it will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. And then in verse um, 16, it says the dead in Christ will rise first. And in verse um, 17, it says, then the alive and remain will be caught up together with them. That is the resurrected in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so it was really clear to me that the resurrection has to happen before the rapture. And um, it wasn't, it was still took me a while as I was searching through the scriptures. Then I, I read revelation 20 again. And when I started reading about the first resurrection, I was completely convinced other passages that a lot of other people have told me that have cause them to be post-trib is second Thessalonians two. I think that's the same thread that you, you took me through. You, you took me to first mm-hmm. Thessalonians four, which is a passage again. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, uh, you know, the go-to rapture passage and, and you pointed out the resurrection and then, and then you took me to uh, revelation 20 uh, verses four through, well, I guess probably one through six. And, yeah. Uh, Ask me that question. If, if this is, uh, if this is the first re- resurrection, which is very interesting that they even use that indication there uh, yeah. about first. And uh, then how can this be beforehand? And uh, I'm, I'm looking at it. And I'm like, because, I mean, really with the pre-tribulation view, it was like, what? I mean, really, I mean, it was the defenses that I, I did know was just vague. And I'm looking like, the, oh, my goodness, it's there. And then you took me mm-hmm. to Thessalonians 2 and. It's like, I mean, to me, that's just as clear as day. Uh, but, but I know for me, it was almost like I had a veil uh, that I, yeah. just, I mean, I could, I read those passages. I mean, I was in Revelation 20 all the time and just was blinded to that. Uh, so I, I know you reach out to a lot of folks and I, I just, I think that's, I love what you're doing. Keep it up. I know it's got to be discouraging. And I, I'm just curious, what's the typical response that you get? Uh, and Deb, you seem to be unable to sway many people. Um, I, it really varies. A lot of people respond with one of the 10 arguments that I see all the time and I have articles written about them. (laughs) Um, on my website, I have an answer section and there are things like, but we won't suffer wrath and he comes like a thief and, the man of lawlessness, uh, the church will be cut up before the man of lawlessness is revealed, things like that. And once in the cloud, once in the Mount of Olives. 
So usually I'll try to share an article that is about to answer the question that they just kind of threw at me. And um, sometimes they read it, sometimes they don't. I think probably more than often, if somebody's heart is not open at all to hearing it, they won't even read it. Um, But the people who actually read it sometimes are more open. But I have the antagonists too, you know. Um, And people that say I'm not a Christian because I'm not free trib or call me Jezebel or whatever. I get really? a lot of you abuse. You Jezebel over the rapture timing. Yeah, twice. <laughs> wow, wow. I mean, it's, uh, that is something to, I think, be proud of that uh, <laughs> you've uh, stirred up the hornet's nest that much. And then yeah. I appreciate what you're doing. And I, I really wanted to to let you be a part of Rapture Week because it's a huge part of, of me understanding the rapture. And I, I think you're having a lot more impact than you realize. And if anything, there's not going to be blood on your hands. Uh, you're you're making the, the trumpet call. And, and well, that's probably a bad term to use with the rapture, but uh, you're putting the warning out. And so Nick, yeah. blog post, uh, how can people uh, reach out to you and, and find you? Um, my website is overcomingthetribulation.com. Sounds good. Well, Ned, I, I appreciate you uh, being a part of this. And since you're starting a YouTube channel, you can we, we will get you some content right here that you can you can put on it. Annette, yeah. thank you and uh, for being with us. And I hope people will reach out and uh, check out your blog, check out your website. Uh, End Time Church, thank you for being a part of Rapture Week. Uh, we look forward to sharing the rest with you. And uh, again discern and i hope even this would be a lesson we need to be open uh and we understand that god wants to lead us to the truth and if we're seeking it we need to be open to how he's going to share it yes welcome my friends this is end time church uh we wanted to provide hey there's pastor anderson what's up dudes and dudettes out there in uh etc land there we are no no, now do it. Okay, now you're good. Uh, praise God for technology. Uh, Chris Fermanti is here. Jake McCandless is now there. And Annette joined us uh, earlier uh, to record that. And we're very thankful for her because, like Jake said, she is all about just following up with folks on Twitter. And that's basically her ministry. And, yeah, if you don't follow her, you need to just to, to see it. I mean, uh, but, and by the way, Pastor Jezebel, uh <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, that's a total misuse of Jezebel, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're leading yeah. somebody astray uh, with the rapture, uh, your rapture theory. Right. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, so Annette, as as I shared in the video, we recorded ahead of time so we could we could just really manage the time tonight. Uh, but we, well, manage the time <laughs> relatively. But anyway, uh, but at the same time, wanted the chance to uh, you to hear from Annette because she's the reason, a uh, big reason why I went in the you know, eyes were open to what's going on. You already heard all that. Uh, but yeah, you need a follower. I've, I've seen her attack some, some attacks the wrong word, but confront people. Challenge. I mean, she does it, man. She challenges, challenges it. And most of the time people don't listen. It's a lesson that, to me that we need to be, you know, listening to the Holy spirit. We need to check from the spirit. So uh mm-hmm. big night tonight, rapture week, uh, not, you know, shark week was just a week. We're making it five. A lot going on. Rapture 360. You're going to get the full angle. And uh, so stick it in here at all. And Pastor Manti on the call tonight. So looking forward to that. Part do. Part, Part do. Yeah. So get the app. Where I, I have real one thing to tell you all. Get the app. Welcome. Say hello. Uh, participate in the chat, even if you're not on our site. But I do encourage you to go endtime.church slash live. Or just hit the button for live. Uh fellowship with us now all week long on the app we're doing that i mean that's not a just a saying it's actually happening where yeah. folks are really getting together and we're doing prayer times and, and all the discipleship all the rest of it's awesome uh and then give uh we want you to f- be generous in your giving because this is a mission that's plowing ahead we are not um we don't we don't have anyone to look to frankly you know god is using us to trailblaze and to forerunner you know, be a forerunner in this stuff. So, hey, I'm just saying, you know what, Lord, use us. That's fine. Send us out. Let's all do this together. And if he's guiding us, it's going to succeed. All right, I'm done. 
Okay, so yeah, <laughs> you stopped real. I need to save. I need to save the that. voice. Yeah. I got like fifty yeah. slides coming up. <laughs> we got a lot to get to, uh, but we want to make sure we get a chance to worship because that is the. Uh, the I mean, that's what we gathered. I mean, we were ready for the message tonight. We're ready to hear this teaching on the rapture. But what makes end time church special is the fact that we can gather together and worship, work through this together and fellowship. And so we have the opportunity to worship. Pastor Anderson, thank you for that. Let's do it. Well, tonight uh, we got an audience of one. Every night tonight, it's an audience of one. See, worship is not about the music. It's not about the song. Now that has that plays a part in that it creates an atmosphere. But our worship is the pouring out of our hearts, our affection to God. It's it's blessing him with our worship, with, with our words, with the heartfelt conviction that we have of adoration to the Father. And so tonight, I want you to join me as we worship the audience of one, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Yeshua HaMashiach. Join me tonight as we play. Oh, his love in us, 
Forever is love in doors. Forever is love in doors. Forever and ever we have found. We have found our hope. We have found our peace. We have found our rest. We're the one who loves. He will light the way. He will lead us home as we are. Jesus, God, be glorified in our praise today, Lord. We worship you, God, our audience of one tonight. We thank you, Lord, that your love endures. We bless you today, Jesus. We love you. Praise, what have you done? Murder for me on the cross, accused, absence of wrong, my sin washed away in your blood, too much to make sense of it all, to know that your love breaks my fall, the scandal of grace, you died in my place, so my soul will live, oh, to be like you, to give all I have just to know you, Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in my heart. There is your state, the power is dead as my sin. The cross has taught me to live, and mercy my heart now to see. The day in its trouble shall come, I know your strength is enough. The scandal of grace, you died in my place, so my soul will live. Oh, to be like you, to give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in my heart. Oh, be like you, to give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in my hope. And it's all because of you, Jesus, it's all. Because of you, Jesus, it's all because of your love and my 
amazing grace. I thank you, Jesus, for your amazing grace. This life that we live, God, this ministry that we have at End Time Church or any other ministry we have, God, Lord, our families, our work, our life, God, it's all for you, Jesus. It's all for you, God. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, God. God, our 
Thank you, Pastor Anderson. Again, thank you for everybody being here as we continue Rapture Weeks, hearing from Pastor Christopher Manti tonight as he is uh, talking why the Rapture needs to be late. And uh, if you, and I hope you'll continue in the following weeks as we continue to really kind of give every look we can at the, the Rapture timing. Uh, let me pray, and uh, we'll get get Pastor Manti in here and get this started. Father, thank you so much for everybody here. Uh, Father, thank you for End Time Church and what it uh, what it stands for, what it's what you're trying to do through it. Uh, Father, for the the friendships and fellowships and connections and everything that's been done through this over the past couple of years. Father, we look forward to what you have in the future. Father, I pray tonight that you uh, bring clarity, uh, Lord, that you prepare our hearts, uh, you uh, have us ready to discern and ready to hear and ready to obey the word in your direction. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. Thank you so much, Pastor Anderson and Pastor Jake. Uh, you withhold up many things in this ministry. And welcome to you, friends. Let's get right into it. I know uh, folks are anxious. First of all, I, I, we've got a lot of comments, a lot of views so far uh, tonight, and that's awesome. I love the passion for the Word of God, um, knowing that God has the answer correct and that we are just His students, right, and the clay that He is molding. Um, so with that in mind, let us continue, in my view, a very, very simple procedure to get the truth of the matter uh, behind what we call the rapture. So Pastor Jake last week... Um, led off with, you know, his experience in this. And tonight I'm going to show, I'm very confident, uh, that we will prove why the rapture must be after. There are words that the scripture uses that matter. Like after, like first, like last, like keep. So we're going to go through those now with all the associated scripture references on your screen. All right. So no worries about that. So let's get going. And just so y'all know, we're not be taking questions. Okay. In the chat. So please save your fingers and uh, realize this is just going out to everyone widely. All right. First of all, it's important to know where I came from in this. I certainly was not born 
of believing what I do today. I did not become a Christian believing what I do today about this topic. Um, I even was brought up, you know, through teenage years into my twenties, not believing what I currently do about this topic. So it's not as if I was raised and, and this had been drilled into my mind and I am totally unteachable. Um, real quickly, I was raised Catholic. Uh, but I always had a great love of the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. Not that we ever covered those things in church, uh, but I did always love reading them even as a child. Uh, and so at one point there, I left the Catholic church and I just went to my local library, for those of you who remember that, what those are, uh, and checked out every single end time book that I could find. And I'm not joking about that. Uh, I just devoured the, the subject. And what I found was in those books that all the quote unquote smart people believed, um, that it was a pre tribulation rapture. So I believed it. So for three years, I not only believed it, but I told my whole family about it. I told anyone who would listen about it. I said, we've got to get ready. It could be any moment, it could be any month, it could be next month. There was even a book that I read who had a specific date for it. So I was hung up on that. And we even have seen that tonight in the chat. So I know where you're coming from. It, it, there's a there's an urgency there, which I like. I think that's great to have that urgency. Um, but going through it and just, you know, going, through, we never understand every little detail. Some things just stuck out and, uh, didn't quite make sense to me. And basically one day God just asked when I asked him, Hey Lord, will you just clarify this for me? He basically asked me what makes you better than them. Better than the original apostles, better than Christians in the first century, better than Stephen who gave his life, better than Paul who got his head chopped off. Better than any generation of believers in the past 20 centuries. What makes you worthy to escape the same things that they've been enduring? And by the way, the other question that stuck in my mind always was, which Christians are Christian enough to be raptured anyway? Because all I heard was, well, every Christian is going to go. But then in the same breath, you say, well, this denomination, they're not really Christians. That denomination, they're not really Christians. Well, somebody's really, really wrong there, right? So who gets to go? Who's Christian enough? So these things were always sticking with me. So it was time to go back to school. By the way, that was not a picture of me, but similar. It was time to go back to school. And thank God... It turns out it was actually very easy to understand this subject when we let God speak for himself. Example one. Last means last. Can we agree on that? When you say the word last, it means nothing happens after that. It's the last one. To wit. The last trumpet, 1 Corinthians 15. Here's the scripture. I'm going to cover a sliver here, but you want to read basically from chapter uh, verse 12 all the way to the end. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. That means I'm revealing a mystery, okay? He's not giving you a new mystery. He's revealing an old one. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So I think Annette actually mentioned this earlier when we let off the service tonight. There are two groups here, the dead Christians and the ones who are still alive when Jesus comes. 
and we are all changed at that time. For this corruptible body must put on incorruption, and this mortal body must put on immortality, can't die. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, and this mortal put on immortality, then, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, Sheol, the grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Why would he tell us to do this? Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. In the Lord, be steadfast and immovable. Because one day we'll be changed, but not till the last trumpet. First Thessalonians chapter 4. These are the rapture verses, are they not? But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. Again, talking to the brethren, the Christians, okay? To a church, this was written, just like Corinthians was written to a church of believers. This is to a church of believers. Don't be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. Again, what does to be asleep mean? They're dead. So that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and I hope you do, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. In other words, those who have died as Christians. They come with Jesus at this event. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This is the Lord's word, not Paul's word or an opinion, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, the last trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So, and so, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. It doesn't matter if you're alive when he comes or you're dead in Christ. We're still going to be gathered together when he comes at that last trumpet. And we see what happens. Only the dead have come to life. And we're changed together. Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians 5, do not make the mistake of your um, chapter division in your Bible. Those are artificially inserted. This is a prime example of when you should not pay attention to that. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 are the same thought. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. In other words, when does this gathering happen? What is the time and the season that the dead will be raised and we are gathered together with him in the clouds when he returns? When is that time? He said, you should know this already. You don't need me to write to you. you. Yourselves already know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, but they shall not escape. You, brethren, are not in the darkness, so that this day should overtake you like a thief. Listen there. He just says he comes as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord comes as a thief. But those of you who know the times and the seasons will not be taken by the thief. It won't come upon you like a thief. You won't be surprised because you know it's coming next. There cannot be a surprise rapture. It won't be at any time. The day of the Lord will be well known that it's on the way. Those who are watching will know the order of events. And what is it? He just says, what happens first? Peace and safety. What does that mean? Israel has to shout peace and safety because they've made a contract, a covenant, a deal with the Antichrist. And the surrounding nations, it's a peace deal. They will be shouting peace and safety, but then suddenly the Antichrist invades. That all must happen before we can talk about the day of the Lord.
And Paul is already saying, I don't even need to tell you. You know this already. You shouldn't even be confused because you are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor darkness. In other words, the thief comes in the night, but we don't have to worry about that because we know. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, sleepily walking through the world, not knowing what things are coming when, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath. This is a big one, right? That people who believe in any time rapture will tell you. Well, of course he didn't. Not appoint us to wrath, but what about the rest of the sentence? But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the two states of humanity, saved and lost. Either you are saved by Jesus or you're under the wrath of God. Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together. Just like in chapter 4, he's talking about those who are dead in Christ before he comes or those of us who are still alive when he does. We got together. Alive forever, resurrected. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. Little known fact, Paul was quoting the book of Daniel. Daniel 12. 1 to 3. Now listen. What does he say? Peace and safety come first, and then suddenly it comes. At that time, the times and seasons, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands who watch over the sons of your people, Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble. Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah. Such as never was since there was a nation of Israel, even to that time, be the worst things that's ever happened to the Jews. And at that time, your people shall be delivered after the time of trouble. Everyone who is found written in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Well, didn't we just read about that? The resurrection of the dead. Some to everlasting life. How do we get everlasting life? Paul just said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the others, to shame and everlasting contempt. There are two resurrections, turns out. There are other scriptures that say that, by the way. Those who are wise shall shine. Like the brightness of the firmament. Why brightness, shining like brightness? Like the sun Because it's daytime. They're children of the day. Paul just said that. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars. Forever and ever. Eternal life. Immortality. So what does last mean? Last means last. We just saw it. 1 Corinthians 15 says the last trumpet. And what do we see? A comparison, if you go back to verse 12, which we didn't cover, it'll be too long. Flesh versus resurrection bodies. That's all what 1 Corinthians 15 is about, two bodies. When do we get the new body? We don't get it if we're going to heaven. We get it when we come from heaven at the second coming. That's the last trumpet. The last trumpet is the seventh. How do we know that? Uh, Revelation 8 through 11 says there are seven trumpets. And Joshua chapter 6 demonstrates that there are seven trumpets prophetically. The last trumpet is detailed in Revelation 10, 7 and Revelation 11, 15 to 19. It has a name. It's called the mystery of God is finished at that time. What's the mystery of God? The church. The one new man. Fullness of the Gentiles has come into Israel. That's the end of the church. That's the end. All the believers that will believe have come in. That's the mystery of God. That the Gentiles can now come into the children, the kingdom of Israel. Romans chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 2, both say that. 
First Thessalonians 4, as we just saw, the dead in Christ come with him, come with him. So when he's in the clouds to take those of us who are alive and remain on the earth, the dead are with him. Why would they be with him if they weren't coming back? Because they got their new bodies already. It's for the earth. It says we're caught up together. Doesn't mean us living with us living. It means the living and the dead are caught up together. That's the gathering. That's what the rapture is biblically really called, the gathering to Christ. First Thessalonians 5, as we said, the same thought from chapter 4, the same time is the day of the Lord when the wrath of God happens. Wake or sleep will be together. Again, the connection of whether you're alive at this time or whether you're dead in Christ, we're going to be together. And we have that same um, thought in Daniel 12, being asleep or being awake. And it was after the time of great trouble for Israel. So you can't have any trumpets after the last. Remember that. Even if you remember nothing else and you totally disagree with everything you hear, pray on these things. Lord, show me how last doesn't mean last. It does. He's not trying to fool you. How about the opposite? First means first. Not too hard to grasp, right? What is that? We're talking about the first resurrection. As we dealt with uh, earlier with Annette as well. So what's the scripture on that? Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6. I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. This is after Jesus returns, right? Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they came to life. The dead came to life. The dead don't come to life until the seventh trumpet when Jesus returns. And who is included in that? Ones with who wouldn't worship the beast and get the mark of the beast. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years are finished. That's exactly what Daniel 12 just said. But the rest of the dead did not uh, till it was finished. This is the first resurrection. The ones who came to life at the beginning of the thousand years when Jesus returns. That is the first resurrection. You cannot have a resurrection of believers before the first. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death, now we have two deaths as well, not just two resurrections. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hallelujah. So let's take a look at who these guys are who are in the first resurrection. The first meaning the first. Can't have one before this. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. I want you to pay attention to something that they're wearing And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? By the way, can't you hear that today? You don't think our brothers and sisters in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, North Korea, China, Nigeria, on and on, those who are being killed for their faith, which is happening every single day, they're crying out to the Lord, How much longer until you avenge us, till you take justice? To the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, listen, brethren, right, who would be killed as they were was completed. Look at Revelation 9, uh, 7, excuse me. Now, Look at the similarities again. After these things, I looked, behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. 
you have to be a martyr to get a white robe at this point. Don't you? You have to be dead. Like, you died on the earth. Not raptured. Died. In heaven. Died. They are clothed with white robes. But wait, I thought the great multitude was the, this great party of raptured saints. No, it's nowhere in there. It says raptured. They died. There's a great multitude because there will be a great martyrdom. And I believe this is counting up the martyrs from all the ages. Clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying salvation. No, not how long, O Lord. Now it's salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these? Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? Hmm. And I said to him, I don't know. Sir, you know. He said to me, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. How can one come out of the great tribulation if you were not in the great tribulation? <laughs> yeah, you can't. They had to have been in it. So you see, I don't care what you think you know about the rapture, it ain't happening until people are dying in the Great Tribulation. Which you should know, we all should know, any prophecy student who, you know, class one of prophecy teaching is the Great Tribulation is the last three and a half years of the age. So they had to be there to come out of it. The first resurrection includes all Christian martyrs who were killed during the Great Tribulation. The first resurrection includes them. Revelation 20 said it. You just saw Revelation 7 says it. Now when does this raising of the bodies come into play? Uh, Jesus spoke on this, did you know? John chapter 6. Verse 39, 40, 44, 54. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Oh, forgot to underline that. At the last day. And this is how the will of him who sent me, this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 11. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. But Martha said to him, I know, Lord, he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. Amen. So when does the resurrection happen? Well, it can't happen before the first one. Revelation 20, first resurrection includes those beheaded in the Great Tribulation. It says that. Revelation 6 and Revelation 7, the white robes are given only to martyrs. John chapter 6 and chapter 11 means the resurrection happens on the last day. Jesus the Christ, your Lord, said so. So, that's the rapture. Now that we know, hopefully, that last means last and first means first, how about the word keep? I will keep you, Revelation 3 says. Now, this is 
to my experience, uh, this is the prime answer or first defense, first line of defense for someone who says, oh, we can't, the rapture's got to be any moment. Because Revelation 3 says, he will keep me from the hour of temptation. Oh, look at that. I'm just looking in the, the uh, comments, and there it is. Here you go, Omar. I know your works. See, I have set before you. You can't just take one verse. Look at the whole thing. I've set before you an open door. No one can shut it. For you have a little strength. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. There's something to that fact. Keeping his word. Because you have kept... I can even have done it, the sentence above that too. Kept my command to persevere. The word kept is toreo. You have kept my command to persevere. I will also keep toreo you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one may take your crown. Why would he tell us to keep his word, not deny his name, keep his command to persevere and hold fast if he's going to take you away before? The word keep doesn't mean remove. Keep you means like you keep his commandments. To keep his commandments, does that mean to remove his commandments from your life? Of course not. Here's the definition. Go look it up. It's a verb. In your Strong's Concordance number G5083, it says to keep watch over, to guard, to observe. How can, look at Revelation 3 again with that understanding in mind. To keep you from the hour of temptation means to keep watch over you in the hour of temptation, to guard you in the hour of temptation, to observe, to watch you. Don't believe me? Look at the same word talking about the same event in John 17 where Jesus himself is praying. You think tereo means removal from the world? Because it says, I'll keep you from the time of trial or temptation that's coming on the world you think that means take you away from the world look what jesus says but now i come to you and these things i speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves i have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as i am not of the world i do here it is i do not pray that you should take them out of the world but you should keep toreo them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. That's the way you get kept from the world. You don't get removed from it. He specifically prayed that you don't get removed from the world. Example two, Revelation 16. Apply this, take away a uh, nonsense of a definition to this sentence. Behold, I am coming as a thief, which we just heard from Paul. Blessed is he who watches and keeps, Toreo, his garments. Would you want to throw your garments away? Remove them from yourself? Would you call that keeping your garments? Or does it mean remaining clothed? It means remaining clothed. Lest he walk naked and they see his shame to be shamefully exposed. Toreo does not mean to go away to heaven or to remove from the world. It means watch, guard, observe, persevere, keep my commands. That's what it means. The same word in other contexts used in the Gospels, to keep the commandment. Go look it up. Do a word search on Toreo in the New Testament. Keep my commandments. Keep the commandments. Keep my word. Keep the Sabbath. You cannot in, in any way massage that to mean removal from the earth. It means to keep. <laughs> 
to observe it, to do it, to protect in the midst of the world and the enemy. Same word, same context, John 17, 15. I'm telling you, I go to this constantly. Just say, if you're in a battle over this and somebody brings up Revelation 3 and that, they don't want to hear that what Tereo means, go look up John 17, 15. Jesus says, don't remove it from the world. What is, is, is his prayer going to be answered? Yes, it is. Revelation 3.10 is the exact opposite of a rapture to remove us from the earth. It's the opposite. Keep means keep. After now means after. I hope we're being clear here because God is being exceptionally clear. After means after. After the tribulation, for example. Matthew 24, Mark 13. Let's take a look. Uh, In a minute, we'll take a look at that. But look at 2 Thessalonians 2. What does it mean to say after the tribulation? Now, brethren. Again, brothers, sisters. Christians to the church of Thessalonica. The church. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And our gathering together to him, that's the rapture. We ask you, do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by a spirit or by a word or by a letter, as if it was from us, the apostles, because it's not. As though the day of the Lord had come. The day of the Lord was understood to be the return of Jesus when he gathered his saints to himself. That day will not come yet. It is not today. It is not tomorrow. Why? Apostle Paul, who has direct experience on the road to Damascus with the risen Jesus, says, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, capital D, the what? Day of the Lord will not come the gathering to Christ, the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. That day will not happen until, number one, the falling away comes first, the apostasy, the great apostasy. And two, The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exhausts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God in the temple of God, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember when I told you these things when I was still with you? First Thessalonians, he said the same thing. When I was with you the first time, I already told you how this gall goes down. It's not going to happen right away. We've got to have the peace and safety part. That's this. Then comes what? The great falling away and the Antichrist sitting in the temple. Nobody, nobody in any interpretation, no no theory that I've ever heard, puts the Antichrist being revealed and sitting in the temple in Jerusalem before the final seven years. Of course not. Doesn't make any sense. By the way, the reign of the Antichrist, the Great Tribulation, is what causes the Great Falling Away. Because there's a false prophet on the scene performing miracles that you're not ready for. I'm not ready for. Without the Holy Spirit, you will not endure. You will be deceived. Even the very elect would be deceived if it were possible. You know now what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. The restrainer withholds this time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Who is that? We read it already in Daniel 12. Michael, the great prince of your people, when he stands up, when he removes his protection, then Satan is cast down and the Antichrist 
does his Antichrist thing and sits in the temple of God in Jerusalem. Revelation 12 says the same thing. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Do you see what happens at his coming? The, look at verse 1 and then verse 12. Verse 1, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. We all love that image, right? The Lord's coming on the clouds. We are gathered up together with him, whether living or dead. We're gathered in the clouds. Hallelujah. But also at his coming, he destroys the Antichrist. How is that the rapture? That's before the tribulation. How is that before the tribulation if the Antichrist is killed at this coming? How's it before anything? Seems like it means after. Matthew 24, 15 to 28. This is referring to Daniel 7, 8, 9, 11, and 12. All together. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is just what Paul talked about, the Antichrist sitting in the temple, right? The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. That's the temple structure. There's a outer court, inner court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, right? That's way back in the Torah, guys. It's a physical building. When you see this abomination standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. That means get thou to the book of Daniel. Then... Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. By the way, I wrote a book called Flee to the Mountains because of this verse. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight to the mountains may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This is quoting Daniel chapter 12. This is referred to directly in the book of Revelation about these uh, martyrs that come from the great tribulation and those who suffered and were beheaded take part in the first resurrection. And unless those days were shortened, in other words, ended, No flesh would be saved at all. But for the elect's sake, those days will be stopped, cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. As I just mentioned, the false prophet is is typifies this. Great signs and wonders, just like Revelation 13 says, and Paul says as well, to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms. Don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the carcass is, the eagles will be gathered together. When the Lord comes, every one will see him. When we are gathered to him, everyone will see him. He's coming to destroy this one who brings on this great tribulation. Matthew 24, 29, what happens after the tribulation? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the great one, in other words, The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's what happens after the tribulation. That's called the day of the Lord. There is no time of peace after that. There's no rest for seven years. There's no rest for anything. It's here. Matthew 24, 30. What happens after that? Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, the seventh trumpet. 
and they will gather together, rapture, his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Oh, it sounds like the dead from heaven. We see this also in Mark's gospel, chapter 13. In those days after that tribulation, the same one he just told you about, the sun will be darkened, the moon will like give its light, the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers of heavens in the heavens will be shaken. And then the coming in glory, verse 26. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Do you, are you picking up on this constant reference to the clouds and his coming on the clouds? Because we're raptured to meet him in the clouds, right? Remember that? It's to tie in the verses together. To say, is it the same event, guys? This is what I'm talking about. Then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now that's an extra detail. That means the dead and the living are gathered together and not till the end. Now let's look at Luke 21, the often forgotten chapter about the end times. And there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on earth distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then what? Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, what things? The signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars? After the tribulation is ending? When those things happen, lift up your heads. Because your redemption draws near. The redemption of your body. The resurrection. The rapture. The coming of the Lord. Not when you see some sign seven years before. When you see the signs in the heavens. After the tribulation, then you know the day of the Lord is here. Then your redemption is near. Everyone sees him coming on the clouds. Why does he come on the clouds? Why does everyone see him do that? It's not a secret. It's not a disappearing act. It's not a U-turn. Everyone sees him coming on the clouds. He returns to what? To sit on David's throne. David's throne in Jerusalem and judge the nations. That's why he's coming. That's why he leaves heaven. Look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him the nation of Israel, unbelieving Jews, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. That's Revelation 1, 7. That's also referencing Isaiah 40, verse 5, Daniel 7, 13, Zechariah 12, 10, and Acts 1, 11. All say the same thing. After means after. We have just showed you from the scriptures, not from imagination, not from opinions, not from a video on YouTube. The scripture itself, the rapture event, is not possible until after the Great Tribulation. What happens to the Great Tribulation? The abomination of desolation is seen, which means the Antichrist is in the temple. Jerusalem is invaded, Luke 21. The armies, when you see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, then you know its desolation is next. Right? Jerusalem invaded, which means Jacob's trouble, the greatest time of trouble in the history of Israel. That's what Daniel says, that's what Jesus says, that's what Paul says. The Bible is agreed. And the great falling away happens. What does that mean? Great falling away of Christians from the faith. Mass denial of Jesus by Christians. This is what Annette talked about at the beginning of the broadcast and what we are harping on. I personally am always harping on. We are not ready to see the amount of Christians that will deny Jesus when there's trouble. The Bible says it will happen. 
and it will be massive. It is impossible that the rapture event occurs until after the sun, the moon, and the stars, those signs happen. They begin the day of the Lord. As Jesus returns to the earth in wrath. You're not subject to the wrath of God? That's right, because when he returns, you're in immortal bodies and you're on the team. He's not fighting you. The wrath of the Lamb. Did you know that's what it's called in uh, Revelation 6? Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. The day of the Lord Jesus in another place. I didn't go into all these, but there's many more scriptures on that. After, folks, means after. And finally, the end means the end. He who endures to the end will be saved. Not seven years before the end, not three and a half years before the end, not one year before the end. The end. Matthew 24, 3, as we start or end where we started. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, When will these things be? What did he just say? That the temple will be destroyed completely. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And the end of the age. The end. What will be the sign of the end of the age? First, he says, he goes through all these signs in the beginning of that process. Not the end, but the beginning of sorrows. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And uh, through verse 7. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Christians, he's talking to you. And kill you. Isn't this, I I love how plain spoken Jesus is. He's such a beautiful God. No secret formulas. You don't need a doctorate. There's no Bible code, okay? You will go through the tribulation and you will be killed. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Not because you're a nice guy, not because you root for the wrong football team, because of me. Because you hold my name as yours, Christian. And then many will be offended. Many what? Many Christians will be offended. Because of what's coming on the earth, they'll be offended at God for sending them tribulation. How dare you, God? I thought you loved me. I thought you loved your bride. How could you let her get beat up? Is what this ridiculous statement that many, unfortunately, you listening have said. Thank God I never said something so dumb. They'll be offended at God. They'll betray one another. Christians will betray each other. And will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Maybe ones who say, hey, you know what? Jesus is already here. Yeah. His name is Isa, but that's Jesus. And deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, be everywhere, the love of many Christians will grow cold. These are all tribulation facts. Okay? But he who endures to the end will be saved, shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom is coming, The tribulation comes first. We must endure to the end. That gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Endure till that moment. By the way, I think this is just some uh, things about end times and, and death and destruction and martyrdom. He says it in a different way at the very end of the gospel, Matthew 28. All authority is to be given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples 
of the nations, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Endure to the very last day of the age. That's what certain translations of that verse say. The very last day of the age. The last day. What happens in the last day, John chapter 6? The resurrection. The Holy Spirit will be with you the whole time. There is no removal of my church. You're always here till the very last day when I come. Jesus will be with us as we take the gospel to all the nations, ending it where it all began in Israel. The end of the age cannot come until the Jews of Jerusalem call for him. Did you know? And this is the emotional climax of why the rapture issue matters. Why? It's a big deal that it's not at any moment. Why? It's a big deal that it can't be before he is counting on us. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Are you willing to endure that? How often I wanted to gather your children together That's why the rapture is called the gathering, friends, of his children. As a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. And surely I say to you, you shall not see me again. Until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we know that's a prophetic psalm awaiting fulfillment. Remember when we said you'll be witnesses of all to all the nations? Lord, when he's about to ascend to heaven, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because the apostles know that's what's next. The king is here. The Messiah has risen from the dead. And now it's time for Israel to be restored. And he said, it's not to, for you to know the times or seasons because you, Peter, John, and the rest, you'll be dead. This is for a generation still to come. It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall, you standing right here, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's the Great Commission, right? Witness means is martus. Many of you know this already. You will be my martyrs in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. First Corinthians 2 7. We referenced this in the beginning. The wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, but now is revealed. What plan was previously hidden that is not revealed that will lead to the seventh trumpet? The plan was the opening up of the kingdom of Israel to the Gentile nations, whosoever will, the church. Israel will call for Jesus and Say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord at the seventh trumpet. We know this because it says the tribes of Israel shall mourn when they see him coming with the clouds. They will know, Zechariah says, that they are the ones who pierced him. And that is the end. The end of the Gentiles being grafted into their kingdom. Every Jewish person who has not been killed in Jacob's trouble, those who obeyed Jesus and ran to the mountains, 
who are cared for by those Christians who were just simple enough to obey and shelter them, provide for them for those seven years or those three and a half years at the very end. Every Jew who survives will go to Jerusalem and call for him to come. Then all Israel will be saved. And it's not a joke. It's not a figure of speech. He's not trying to fool you. Every Jewish person will be saved on that day. The dead will come back to life. That's Romans 11.15. Paul says it explicitly. What will happen when they receive the Lord Jesus but life from the dead? When they accept him, the bodies themselves rise out of the graves. It's time for the resurrection because the resurrection and the life has come back. Okay. Before the last trumpet slash first resurrection, we must know and understand that there is the entire three and a half year great tribulation. Revelation 12 tells us plainly what that the tribulation is not God's wrath it is Satan's wrath against the Jews and the faithful church say this again I don't care if I'm going on for an hour and a half the great tribulation is not the wrath of God. The Great Tribulation is not the wrath of God. It is the wrath of Satan against the Jews and the faithful church. The mature, who is the faithful church? The bride who is matured to the point to be willingly killed martyred to ensure not their family's survival, not their town, not their country, to ensure Israel's survival. That's what mature Christians will do. They will shine like the bright lights of the firmament, like stars forevermore, when the Jews of Israel see that they're willing literally to die for them. They must call on him. If you want Jesus to come, if you want the rapture, if you want the resurrection, then get ready to receive the Jews who will flee. Preach to them. They must call on him. And they will literally save the nation by doing so because if they don't, like Jesus says, no flesh will be saved. Satan would kill every last one of us. So, back to the beginning. What did I learn? Remember, I went back to school. What I learned was this. The last generation of the church, whenever that is, is no better than the first. Or any generation in between. We're not better. We don't deserve better. Nothing different will happen. Persecution, suffering, and martyrdom for the name of Jesus has always been with us and will be until the very last day of the age. The desire to escape is of the flesh. It is not from God. Your desire to be in comfort, your desire to sit in heaven and watch things unfold is from the enemy. It's not what a mature Christian attitude is. And it is not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Word of God says over and over and over and over in so many ways, in so many contexts. 
you want to save your flesh? Can't be my disciple. We're not talking about the same things, Jesus would say. I don't know what you're after, but it's not following me. If you're planning on escaping and getting away from the bad times. The hard times. Last slide, I promise. The rapture or gathering to Christ's scriptures are not there to frighten us, to endure to the end. They're to encourage us to endure to the end. It's our Father's heart. These scriptures are given for us to grow in our faith in the midst of trial and trouble. The promise of his coming and our gathering to him is the anchor that we can hold on to tightly. The anchor of our hope. The living hope. His coming, our resurrection, that day, that great day. And terrible for the world. That day is what we hold on to tightly. Let us all love his appearing for that day. Yes. Remember, Jesus told us, you will, you will be hated by all names, nations, by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And so we've come to the end. <laughs> Why the rapture must be after. If you must rewind and just go back and make it simple. See what the scripture says. Last, first, keep, after. Words matter. And whether it's the rapture subject or anything else, God is not out to fool us. Uh, let me pray together with you. Father, enlighten our minds. Give us courage. Give us the simple understanding that you would have a child understand the scriptures with. Because we know. We know you are not trying to complicate this for us. You know how simple we are. And so you've made it simple. And you repeated yourself so often. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, because that's how we learn. Put it in our mind and heart, the heart of the Father, to see many come to repentance, that none should perish, and that none should desire to flee away from trouble, but to run into the fire, because you're there with us. And you're there at the end. And you're there now. So bless us as we go. Keep us. Teach us. Even if this is a hard lesson, Father, I pray that we may all come to one understanding of this crucial topic in all the world. Every Christian may be agreed. In Jesus' name. Amen. How was the feedback? Did we get any good ones? <laughs> Shark Week was a good comparison to uh, Rapture Weeks. Christopher, that was phenomenal. The best thing I have heard. I hope those watching right now, those watching later, uh, I this this was just a, I, I'm in awe. I mean, it was just incredible, clear presentation, so much evidence. I, I think all of us are blessed to hear this amount of truth. And I know uh, in the chat there's there's different views, and I know when it comes to the rapture, it is the heated most heated subject and and it's it's wild it's wild how that is i see it when i go speak i mean that's the one topic that wants to be discussed wants to be talked about uh i've I've said if we only love jesus as much as we did the rapture Mm. uh you know but i it it comes down to what does scripture say and my hope is if you're listening when you've you've heard the text uh, but still, you're to discern, uh, you're to be a Berean in yourself. Uh, but you have to understand we're, I think, in a situation where some reason that is veiled. And then even when we when we get to it, we say it's no big deal. You know, everybody's got these different views. It's a big deal. I mean, that's some of the things you presented tonight. I mean, even though I've I'm writing and teaching about standing firm, I was more motivated tonight through what you shared uh, to continue that even more so because of just the day the, the
the true dangers ahead. Pastor mm-hmm. Mandai, thank you so much. You amazing. It was amazing. Uh, I think we all have to watch it several times just because there was so much content, but you gave it a great job. And I think we're all blessed to be here. Uh, we do have a, a little bit of time before we typically close the after party. And so let's hop over there. If you'd like to stick around, if you've got questions, if if you're here and uh, you completely disagree with what Pastor Manti have, we invite you in. We invite you in to discuss one thing that we're, we're not here to argue. We're not here to prove a point. We're just simply here uh, to tell the truth that we're working through and sharing it. So I encourage everybody to discern, 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 be Bereans, uh, but also check uh, where you're coming from when you do this. Uh, thank you for being a part of End Time Church. Rapture Weeks continue. Uh, and so Pastor Manti shared why it must be after, uh, which leads us to two of the main four views, uh, the pre-wrath view and the post-tribulation view. Uh, and so we have a speaker next week who will talk about the pre-wrath view. Uh, Dr. Alan Krishner is really the man when it comes to pre-wrath. He's not just written the book. He's written several books on it. Uh, and then the, the with the post-tribulation view, uh, our good friend Daniel Seckham, who we know is going to be thorough with the scriptures. We and know that as well. So look forward to that as he will be back the next week to talk about the post-tribulation view. And then I, I think really just another component of this that gets left out so much is where the rapture fits in, in the fall feast. Uh, as we, and I think really encourage you to be here when Chad with Harvey shares on that. Thanks for being here. Uh, love each and every one of you be here next week for rapture weeks. Come over to the after party. We'll have some fun. I love y'all.